Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to participate uh, in this conference. Um, many people whose work I really admire uh, are participating in this, so it's, it's, it's a real uh, pleasure and privilege for me. Um, before I start, I would like to express my um, concern about everything that's been happening in Hong Kong recently with the new security law and the restrictions on civil liberties and academic freedom, and to express my heartfelt solidarity with colleagues and friends in Hong Kong. So my presentation is, um, it comes out of work that's been funded by the Australian Research Council. I'm kind of legally mandated to say that. Um, and it's, what I'm trying to get across here is um, to provide a framework for understanding what the BRI means in practice what actually gets built, what, what the Belt and Road actually consists of in concrete material terms. And uh, the, the perspective I want to put forward is one of bilateral political economy, where we view this from a critical political economy perspective, but we take a bilateral view looking equally at the Chinese side and the recipient side. And that's necessary because... Um, in, in my discipline, which is international relations, I'm afraid, uh, the view is uh, quite a simplistic one. Often the BRI is framed as being about the Chinese grand strategy or debt trap diplomacy. Um, so we often see maps like this, uh, which show the kind of tentacles of China reaching across the world. And it makes me think about um, earlier uh, treatments of China as a kind of octopus extending its tentacles down in Southeast Asia, um, a kind of rehashed yellow peril discourse is taking hold across a lot of Western countries. And the big flaw with this way of thinking about the BRI is that it's very heavily unilateral. It's intensely focused on China itself, what China is up to, what it wants to do, uh, and what its plans and scheming uh, about around the BRI is really all about. And that's flawed because it, has, it is a simplistic view of what is driving the BRI on the Chinese side, uh, and often kind of reduces the BRI to this brainchild of Xi Jinping, who's often kind of viewed as some kind of uh, Bond villain who uh, has this clever plan for world domination, which is simply being rolled out in a unilateral way by China. It also massively exaggerates Chinese agency and erases the agency of recipient states in shaping what the BRI means in practice. And this is a very common problem in uh, international relations, which uh, often when we're talking about IR and, and America has been the focus, for example, the focus is very much on American foreign policy and what the United States wants and uh, other states are not assumed to have any agency. The corrective to this, I think, is a bilateral political economy perspective that looks at both the Chinese side and the recipient side. So on the Chinese side, uh, I think a critical political economy lens focuses less on grand strategy and sees the BRI more as a spatial fix for a deep crisis of Chinese capitalism, which is mediated by the precise nature of the Chinese party state. The fact that it is uh, highly fragmented, um, decentralized, and unevenly internationalized, which leads to, I think, a very non-strategic approach to outbound investments and development financing. And I think spe the specific nature of BRI projects and the outcomes that flow from them stem from the interaction of that on the Chinese side and the way that interacts with project-specific dynamics in target states. So we cannot understand what gets built in the name of the Belt and Road without understanding what is going on in the target states as well. So let me just step through that argument point by point. On the Chinese side, uh, I think it is uh, very useful to think about the BRI as a spatial fix to a crisis in the Chinese economy. The spatial fix is a term developed by David Harvey, the Marxist geographer, who argues that economic crises always are resolved in a spatial way by changing the scale or scope of capital accumulation and creating uh, new markets for, uh, for capital accumulation. So I think th the nature of that crisis is well established in the political economy um, literature, and it has 
four main dynamics. The first is the crisis in China's infrastructure-led growth model, where investment in infrastructure is no longer delivering uh, the, the benefits in terms of um, spillover economic growth and the recycling of, that, uh, of, of proceeds from growth into new rounds of investment. This is linked to uh, a long-standing and intensifying overcapacity crisis, both with respect to the provision of domestic infrastructure and uh, basic industry. Um, BRI followed hot on the heels of the winding up of the stimulus package announced by Beijing um, in the wake of the global financial crisis, which prevented the Chinese economy going into uh, recession. But a lot of that went on domestic infrastructure and only compounded the problems of the growth model and overcapacity. And the fourth dimension of the crisis is the overaccumulation of capital within the Chinese banking system and the uh, drying up of avenues for profitable investment domestically. So I think we can think of the BRI as the latest spatial fix to these long-standing problems in the Chinese economy. And this is not a new strategy, uh, the going out uh, policy, the Great Western Development Campaign were earlier attempts to find new spatial arrangements for uh, Chinese capital accumulation internally and externally. So the BRI is about providing loans um, and trying to increase overseas contracting to soak up excess capacity and capital and a great deal of um, the project documents scrutinized in the early years show that uh, this is in fact what was driving uh, a lot of overseas projects. It is clearly part of the National Development and Reform Commission's spatial planning, their approach to planning the economy, which is shifting low value industries inland towards the less developed regions or indeed offshore. Now, of course, this scheme also appeals to those involved in diplomacy and geopolitics because it can be seen as a way to gain global influence. But I think it's important to emphasize those are not the interests that are primarily driving the BRI. It is economic agencies like the NDRC, um, which services the leading small group on the uh, BRI and agencies like the Ministry of Commerce, um, provincial governments and state-owned enterprises. Now, this outbound uh, investment drive, this spatial fix, is also mediated by the specific uh, structures and conflicts within the party state. In the last uh, four or five years, I've been developing with Shahar Hamiri a view of China through a state transformation lens to, to foreground changes in the nature of the party state over the last 30 years that shape the way that China engages with the outside world. And those key dynamics we've identified as fragmentation, decentralization and internationalization, um, coupled with uh, continued efforts at the center to steer the system, to coordinate it, and in some cases try to reverse some of these trends. The net result of these dynamics, though, is that uh, despite attempts to improve regulation and tighten up regulation due to many overseas scandals in, and indeed domestic ones, outbound investment from China remains poorly governed. Um, with very limited effective oversight and uh, practically no in-country supervision by Chinese party or state apparatuses. The result is that um, there is no secret uh, blueprint of the BRI. The idea that there is there are these kind of maps drawn up in Beijing and the Chinese are just rolling this out in a unilateral way is simply not true. There is no official map and indeed the Chinese government actually banned um, uh, unofficial maps in 2017. If we look at the key policy documents shaping, guiding, coordinating the BRI, they were all very much, that was all very much populated and driven from the bottom up by state and enterprises and provinces and in practice by recipient governments as well. So the, the legacy of all this, uh, we, none of these are new problems, is frequently um, poor investments, poorly conceived overseas investments. For many years, uh, roughly around half of Chinese over in, overseas investments have been loss making. So I think when you look closely at cases like uh, the Hanban Tota port project, for example, it is more accurate to see this as cock up rather than conspiracy. I don't think there was a deliberate uh, debt trap uh, here, for example. Now on the recipient side, 
it is strange that the agency and importance of recipients has been overlooked um, within a lot of IR scholarship because they're very important for a very simple reason, which is that their consent is required for the Belt and Road to actually be implemented. If these governments do not agree to infrastructure projects on their territory, if they don't agree to contract the debt required to finance these projects, the projects cannot get built. So even if there was some secret blueprint or plan in Beijing about where we wanted to build certain things and how these things were going to eventually link together in some master plan, that plan would have to be constantly revised in light of the interests and agendas of recipient countries and their willingness or otherwise to contract these projects. And that's why it's very explicit on the Chinese side that this is not um, a solo performance. Uh, they call it uh, a, an orchestra performance, uh, a symphony, if you like. It's perhaps more uh, accurate to call it a duet because uh, the BRI unfolds on a bilateral basis through negotiation between the Chinese side and recipient countries about what uh, projects should be foregrounded. And the development plans are docked together um, to create bilateral memoranda of understanding. Now, why should recipient countries want to participate in the BRI? Why is it attractive to them? I think the main reasons can be classified uh, into two categories, need and greed. So on the need side, there are many, many reports you'll be familiar with on the level of infrastructure requirement that is required to maintain economic growth and reduce poverty. And this is a political imperative for many uh, governments in developing countries because it's essential to maintain growth, to maintain economic, um, to make, sorry, it isn't essential to maintain economic growth, uh, to maintain social stability and to legitimize themselves politically. And then there's greed, and this is the more nefarious um, a set of motivations for ruling elites in particular. And this is a range of different benefits that they may be able to extract from particular BRI projects. And I've identified four main ones here. The first, very crudely, is kickbacks that elites can receive. These can be um, bribes or other incentives that can be uh, offered alongside the project to sweeten the deal. Um, and, and this is hardly unique to, uh, to Chinese projects. Construction is the world's most corrupt economic sector. Um, infrastructure projects can also be used as a source of patronage. So there's lots of literature showing that ruling elites tend to direct mega projects towards their home region or towards their uh, political base or their ethnic, particular ethnic group. So uh, that's another political benefit. It's also possible um, because these are often negotiated on a state to state basis rather than being private projects, it's possible for ruling elites to insert their uh, economic and political clients into these schemes through forming joint ventures with Chinese firms. So important uh, oligarchs, for example, can participate in these schemes, uh, maintaining their uh, support for the regime. And fourthly, Sometimes um, Chinese aid comes as a bundle, as a package of measures, uh, not just project specific, but other things are, are bundled in there, which can become side payments to favored groups. So for example, in the Cambodian case, um, military assistance comes alongside big infrastructure projects, which is not surprising because the, the Cambodian military is a key, um, is a key support base for um, the Hun Sen regime, and indeed the Chinese uh, company actually sponsors Hun Sen's personal bodyguard unit. Now, apart from the initial motivations for why uh, projects might be contracted, there are then a, a wider series of political economy and, and social conflict dynamics within countries that shape how, um, how projects are selected, designed, implemented, and the consequences, the political consequences and diplomatic consequences that flow from these projects. So there's a number of different possibilities here, but I foregrounded just, just a few. Um, firstly, I think this is perhaps more, uh, more the, the norm than the exception, is that greed can overwhelm rational development planning. And I think Sri Lanka is really a key case in point here where the Mahinda Rajapaksa regime engaged in uh, lots of uh, mega projects designed to increase the prestige of the government, to win support in the south of the country, um, and indeed to extract uh, kickbacks for members of the president's family. 
And that really overwhelms any sense of reason, any sense of uh, the, the, the rate of return that we're going to get on these, on these profits and leaves the government with a non-profitable uh, project but uh, carrying the debt. And the Chinese side is not doing the due diligence for recipient governments. Second dynamic is that there can be competition and contestation over the spoils of investment. This could be between elite groups. So, for example, we've seen factional rivalry in the Philippines over um, Chinese mega projects. And in Malaysia, the uh, Chinese investments became very much bound up with uh, the scandal over the one MDB sovereign wealth fund and the way that that was being bilked by the former prime minister Najib Razak. Um, to uh, keep him and the UMNO government in power. And that fed into a wider backlash against Chinese investment in the general election of 2018 and the revision of some uh, flagship Belt and Road projects thereafter by the successive government. The third kind of dynamic is that we can see a popular or nationalist backlash against um, Chinese investment. Uh, especially when it suits the needs of dominant elites who may be able to exploit this and maybe racialize um, sentiment. And that may be particularly important in countries that either have populist dynamics and or uh, significant uh, ethnic Chinese minorities who have been the subject of um, prejudice and uh, resentment for some time. We've seen that kind of backlash in places like Zambia, for example. Indonesia is another example where um, the kind of Islamist populist coalition that tried to unseat the incumbent at the last presidential election accused the incumbent, um, President Jokowi, of kind of selling out Indonesia and allowing the country to be swamped by Chinese laborers, um, that he was part of a Beijing axis as opposed to a, um, a Mecca axis. So, and that I think has, has really delayed the onset and progress of a lot of key BRI projects in Indonesia. And finally, BRI projects can exacerbate pre-existing conflicts. They don't create these conflicts, uh, but they definitely play into them. Myanmar is, an, is a good case in point where many Chinese investment projects have exacerbated uh, the country's long-running ethnic uh, civil war. And that has both set back the progress of these projects um, in some cases leading to their suspension and a crisis in diplomatic relations. So it's the combination of these Chinese side dynamics um, with these domestic factors in, in recipient states that really shapes which projects are selected, how they're designed, how they're implemented, and whether they're successful and who they're successful for, um, and or whether they produce blowback for China and pushback resistance. So to conclude, I think if you want to explain what actually happens in the BRI, at least with respect to um, infrastructure projects, whether which are their main um, external manifestation, they're not their only one, you need to think about this from a political economy perspective and in a two-sided way. The outbound dynamics coming from China are decided to find a spatial fix for China's economic crisis and the specific um, contours and conflicts within the Chinese party state, and then the political economy and social conflict dynamics on the recipient sides that produce particular outcomes. And I should emphasize that these are project-specific outcomes because different interests, agendas uh, are involved in different projects, and some can be implemented very smoothly and successfully, and some can be implemented disastrously, even within the same country. And if anybody's interested to, to delve into this argument in more depth, um, I've got a report out just today with Chatham House, uh, co-authored with Shahar Hamiri, called Debunking the Myth of Debt Trap Diplomacy, How Recipient Countries Shape um, China's Belt and Road Initiative. So do check that out. I'll end there for Q&A. Great. Thank you, Lee. Very interesting. So we have a, I want to start with a question from the um, webinar audience. Uh, the question is from Derek. What is your opinion that some of these BRI investments are efforts of capital flight by SOEs and private enterprises, uh, given China's restrictions on capital? Yeah, I think that's um, that's a key motivation in some cases, particularly in terms of real estate investment, which is an extremely um, 
uh, corrupt and uh, troublesome sector. And it's one of the reasons why the Ministry of Commerce um, banned investment in overseas entertainment and uh, real estate in 2018, 20, 2018, I think, maybe 2017. And so that category has really decreased. Uh, but that is definitely, I think, a form of capital flight. Um, and it can also be a form of money laundering, of course. Um, there's another question actually from Shoyan, but it's short, so I'll just uh, verbalize it. So she's asking about whether investments, if you think about the industrial parks as part of the BRI, some host economies are seeking productive investments that can expand their manufacturing capacities. How important do you think that? I think there's a difference between industrial parks and uh, productive investments, though. So industrial parks can simply be a constructing a construction project. And there's some really good literature on um, industrial parks in Southeast Asia, which really emblematize um, my argument, really, because it shows that the outbound investments behind these industrial parks were driven by surplus capacity in China, that there were just too many industrial parks in China and not enough investors. Um, and so they found willing partners in Southeast Asia, built these industrial parks and this was before the BRI, right? This is part of the going out um, Great Western Development um, stuff. And 10 years, 15 years on, a lot of them are empty uh, or there's not many investors and they're being propped up by rolling over of loans from Chinese banks. So this is a, re this is a really good example of, of uh, investment that, that, that isn't productive, uh, that isn't, it doesn't yield an expected return. Productive investment is something that's quite different. Um, so if you are literally investing in productive uh, factories and outlets um, within a country, that could be potentially uh, you know, quite useful and potentially help to transform um, a country's economy. Um, but it really depends who is left. The key thing here is who's left holding the risk. So a lot of what the BRI is about, I think, is shifting risk from Chinese state-owned enterprises to recipient countries. So if a Chinese SOI contracts debt in order to do a project overseas, then they hold the risk if things go wrong, if, it's not, um, if it doesn't actually deliver a, a rate of return. So the attempt here is to shift the debt burden onto recipient countries. Of course, the SOE still gets the money immediately. The money never leaves China. It just goes straight to the SOE, not the recipient. But the host country is left holding the debt. And so if the project doesn't pay, uh, then they're in trouble. Uh, that's, not, that's not debt trap diplomacy. It's just clever business, sharp business practice. Um, but... Uh, it's a serious problem. So if Chinese SOEs are engaged in uh, productive investment, for example, and they shoulder the risk, then it suggests that they know that they can make a profit on their investment. And that can be, that can be a good thing. But there is a massive problem of moral hazard that was flagged in the first presentation when the people getting the contract and building the project have no real incentive to do any due diligence to make sure that it will yield the return. Uh, Shui Gong, do you want to ask your question? You have a typed a long question in chat. Maybe you can just verbalize it. Shui Gong? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, do you want me to repeat that? Yeah. Just okay. Tell me. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lee, uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation. My question is very simple. Uh, you highlighted, you know, the state transformation of China, right? One thing is fragmentation and the other is decentralization. I'm very puzzled how those two, you know, features could play out in Xi Jinping's concentration of power. I have that question because, you know, uh, since 2012, when chi the Chinese government initiated, uh, I think, uh, launched around 21 guidelines uh, on regulating and monitoring uh, the overseas investments. But you see, you know, from uh, 2013, uh, we have lots, lots of negative reports. And as a matter of fact, they're based, they're backed by those, um, by some evidences. So why those, you know, supervision power couldn't really be translated to, you know, those um, behavior of the SOE. So I'm, I'm puzzled about the dynamics on the mm. three points. Thank you. It's, it's an excellent question and 
I, Shahar and I have just been contracted actually to publish our book called Fractured China uh, with Cambridge University Press. It will be coming out next year and that will explain, in, that will answer your question in detail. <laughs> Uh, but uh, to, to preview that argument, um, these, these dynamics are not simply a one-way process of dissolution. So I mentioned that there were various uh, control mechanisms that the centre has to try to coordinate the different actors within the party state and try to steer them in a, in a broadly preferable direction. Um, and the most important of these is obviously the Communist Party itself. Uh, it's, its powers of discipline, inspection, uh, personnel appointments, and then there's the incentives uh, given by state uh, banks and so on. So there are a number of uh, quite powerful control mechanisms that the centre has, which influence how the system works and always have influenced how the system works, but don't work entirely. So the way that I see what Xi Jinping has done in recent years is he's, he's been a very forceful player in this tug of war between the centre and the, the fragmented entities in the party state. Um, but he's not fundamentally changed how the system works. The centre is still in the business of setting out quite broad and vague guidelines. And given that the BRI is his signature foreign policy written into the constitution, it's a great test case for this. Uh, and I wrote an article with um, uh, Jing Hang Zhen uh, in uh, Third World Quarterly, which explains how this works in practice. So the, the, point, the point about Xi Jinping is that he has tried to exercise more control over lower levels, um, and he has tried to rein in SOE malpractice, but he clearly hasn't been entirely successful. So we've seen his direct instructions on reducing overcapacity, for example, in uh, steel and uh, uh, power generation and curbing pollution and so on within China. Those, those orders are simply disobeyed. Uh, until the government promises more financial assistance. The provinces just don't do it. and They just lie about it and they try and hide it. So that's happening inside China. So imagine how bad things are outside of China when they are not very tightly scrutinized or controlled at all. You have to remember none of the policy banks, which mostly finance these outbound investments, have officers on the ground. None of them are able to inspect these projects directly. The only people who are overseas are... Ministry of Commerce officials, who are primarily see their role as facilitating the expansion of Chinese businesses to promote growth and employment in China, not regulating and disallowing investment and punishing SOEs. And increasingly, uh, Commission of Discipline Inspection uh, units that are deployed to try to tackle corruption in overseas projects. Um, and they are few and far between, and they're targeted at specifically problematic countries like Laos, for example. So SOEs can get away with quite a lot. And the, government, the Chinese government's own data shows that, for example, majority of Chinese SOEs are not engaging in social impact assessments, despite the fact that's required by Chinese law. Uh, they're ignorant of local uh, regulations that they're supposed to follow. And so on. The Chinese government knows this is the case, but this is a persistent problem in the Chinese party state of central control over uh, subordinate actors. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lee, we have a, a question from the webinar audience from Brian. I don't actually quite understand it, so let me just repeat it. The responsibility of host countries in this relationship is important. Some countries just aren't responsible. Is there a need for Angola mode type arrangements in order for China to moderate this risk? Which I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge problem. And the bottom line is that uh, China won't do your due diligence for you. And you might say, well, why should they? Uh, you know, they're sovereign governments. Nobody's putting a gun to their head and forcing them to accept projects. Um, but I think a lot of them are kind of allured by the glitter of China. You know, China is very, the most successful developing country in the history of the planet. And they think, oh, they've got the secret. They know what they're doing. So if they come in and do a project, it must be good. Um, and that's just not true. They, they won't do the due diligence for you. So I think it's very, this is a really difficult one to solve because, you know, development planning is not technical, rational. It's political. So I don't think you can ever get away from the problems that I identified, but governments that are serious about mitigating this risk need to bring in as much um, external expertise as possible in evaluating the uh, feasibility and the rate of return that they'll get on projects. 
and they need to expose it to the widest possible scrutiny of civil society, of academic experts, and so on. And ideally, open up projects to open tendering. And in many cases, Chinese enterprises are willing to participate in those kinds of, in those kinds of activities. But I really think that the way that um, BRI projects work out really depends most heavily on host state regulation. And that's still recognized in China's own regulations.